sir, I've done that. Uh, just a tip, anybody wants to unmute in between, uh, press the space button and you can unmute and speak. I love the fact that uh, on my shirt there's a donkey and uh, on Sachin's a Ferrari. <laughs> Okay, we can start. We can start, Sajin, sir. Parag goes in first. Parag has to unmute him. He's muted. Parag, unmute your uh, speaker. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, webinar hosted by the Pune Me course. Uh, I welcome all the panelists as well as all the viewers who, who have tuned in today. Uh, we are faced with a very unprecedented situation and uh, it's really uh, a difficult time. Just the government of Maharashtra has announced the extension of the lockdown by two weeks and we are locked down till 29th. So let's hope that helps. So what do we do in the meantime? So. Sachin Tapas, we uh, thought that we should do this uh, Pune Ni course webinar, and here we are. We are very happy to have a very rich faculty today, and we are very happy to have Andy William with us, who has uh, uh, joined us all the way from London. Uh, everybody knows Andy William, and he's going to be the star faculty today, and we have a webinar, which is going to be on all you need to know about ACL surgery. So we have uh, four talks. Well, the first one is on why are ACL reconstructions failing by Dinsha. Then we have a talk on how do I avoid two-stage procedures in revision ACL reconstruction by Dr. Andy Williams. Then we have uh, Sachin speaking on infection in ACL surgery. And then we have Andy Williams again to speak to us on arthrofibrosis after ACL surgery, what are the strategies. And then we have question answers in the end. But after each talk, we will have question answers. So uh, before I hand it over to Andy, all of you know that the Pune Ni course, now we have changed the dates from 23rd, 24th, 25th April to 5th, 6th uh, and 7th of November. All those who had registered uh, for the dates on 23rd, 24th, 25th April, your registration is automatically carried forward to the new dates, which are 5th, 6th and 7th November. Uh, we have three exciting days again of live surgeries. First day is on the meniscus, and the ACLs, the second day we have ACLs, and again we have a postural corner and MCL. Uh, day three, we have uh, the first time a meniscus allograft transplantation surgery, uh, femoral osteotomies, and also trochleoplasty. So these are the various three days full of live surgeries, and all of you know that PKC is all about live surgeries. Morning, eight o'clock, the breakfast sessions continue. Uh, we have how to perform an ideal PCL reconstruction how to evaluate PF instability, how to evaluate postural corners, how to evaluate medial side instability, and also how effectively to use the osteotomy in your practice. We have the oration this time by none other than David Dujour, who will also perform a live surgery, uh, the trochleoplasty, and he, all of you know, is one of the masters of patellofemoral joint instability management, and he will give the PKC oration this year. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Andy Williams, who's joined us today as uh, our faculty, uh, who will be present uh, in November. And uh, all of you know that uh, he has uh, uh, many publications. He's a leading knee surgeon uh, in Europe. And uh, the most important thing, what I feel, is that he's the Gray's Anatomy lead editor. And all of us have read Gray's Anatomy when we were in our first year MBBS, and he's the lead editor for that today. So welcome, William. So all of you, I welcome all of you who have tuned in and look forward to seeing you guys uh, in physical in November. But till then, we have to do with uh, video calls, uh, Zoom calls, uh, and all what we can do. 
So over to Dinsha Paradiwala. Dinsha is going to speak to us uh, on why ACOs are failing. So Dinsha, are you on? So Dinsha is from Mumbai. He works at the Kokila Bain Ambani Hospital and is doing exclusive work in ACLs and revision ACLs. So over to Dinsha Paradiwala. And we also have the faculty. We have Nilesh Kamat. We have Sandeep Biraris. We have Arun Mugam. We have Anshu Sekhar uh, and Ashok Sham who have uh, joined us on this panel. So over to Dinsha Paradiwala. Dinsha, it's all yours. Thank you, Parag. So if anybody has any more... questions, uh, just uh, send them by WhatsApp to Ashok Sham and we'll be taking all those questions. Yes, Dinsha. Thanks, Parag. So I'm going to take, why are ACL reconstructions failing in 2020? We know that ACL reconstructions are commonly performed procedures, the successful procedures. And we can see this particular footballer that I've done about 18 years back with a technique that's not followed today. He played competitive football for eight years. And now 18 years thereafter, he comes for an osteochondral patella fracture. His ACL looks good, revascularized, and many of these patients do well. But with the increase in number of primary ACL reconstructions, we know that the subsequent need for revision ACL reconstructions is also going to increase. And there's a good systematic review of level one and two prospective studies with a minimum five-year follow-up that show that ACL graft rupture ranges from 1.8% to 10.4%, and that with, has a pooled percentage of about 5.8%. So 5.8% of our ACLs are likely to fail. We also know that this is a normal population. If you have a high-risk group and you've got athletes only, you might find that these 5.8% percentages might go right up to 15 or 20% too, as has been seen with adolescent females. Any successful revision of a failed ACL surgery cannot be achieved without understanding the specific etiology and mode of failure of that primary ACL. And so I think for all of us, the causes of ACL reconstruction failure are important to understand. And these are technical, biological, traumatic, failure to recognize secondary instabilities and patient factors. And the most common cause that we at least see are technical reasons. So the first surgery had some problem that went wrong. Something went wrong with that primary procedure and that's why it's failed. You could also get biologic failures. That means your graft hasn't healed. You could get repeat trauma. You could get situations where the patient has had knee instability, but you've taken care of just the ACL and you've left the meniscus or you've left the uh, uh, PLC alone, and that's gonna result in failure of your primary procedure, which is the ACL, or there could be patient factors. Now the multicentric ACL revision group, uh, study group, reported that the distribution of these causes, as deemed by the revising surgeon, was trauma 32%, technical factors 24%, biologic 7%, and a combination of all these factors 37%. But we must realize that there's a little bit of a bias in this, because as soon as it's your own patient, then often you feel that it's trauma or a combination of factors. Whereas as soon as it's someone else's patient that you're revising, you tend to feel that it's maybe technical factors. So I think when you're studying your primary ACL that's failed, try and determine what the cause of his primary failure is. And we'll see these causes in detail. The first is technical factors. And the most common technical factors are non-anatomic tunnel placement. This, in our series, we've seen an up to 65%. And it's not really changed. What we saw in 2010 as the most common cause for our revision ACLs is still the most common cause for revision ACLs in 2019 when we've seen our 10 year sort of uh, causes for revision ACL. Anterior femoral tunnel. So you can see this. If that tunnel here is anterior, your graft is going to be short, flexion is going to be restricted. And over time, when flexion is achieved, that's going to be at the cost of graft failure. On the other hand, you could get a 12 o'clock tunnel, and that again is not gonna serve its purpose. There's gonna be no rotational stability for that knee. If your tibial tunnel is anterior, then you're gonna have graft impingement, 
and slowly that graft is going to have attrition and it's going to fail. If you've got a posterior tibial tunnel, then you're going to have a vertical ACL like this. And with that vertical ACL, of course, you can't expect rotational stability and you probably also want to have translational stability. So that's going to fail. Now, most people feel, yeah, all of these are old x-rays. Uh, what's really happening now? Is it changing now? No. As more and more surgeons keep doing ACL reconstructions, there's going to be a learning curve. And I think in that learning curve, the most important part is where does your femoral insertion sit and can you get that anatomically? So we see this today too, that a lot of our revisions are being done because of non-anatomic femoral tunnels. And if you've got an anterior femoral tunnel with an anterior tibial tunnel, like in this patient, I think that's a double whammy, that ACL is going to fail very, very soon. So for all of you who are beginners and who are just starting off, it's useful to try and determine where is the ACL femoral insertion. And if you'll note, this is where that prior tunnel has gone. That's the graft, a little bit of a protuberant ACL bone there from the BTB with the screw. That's not where your graft should be. That's much too anterior. Try and define the over-the-top position here at the back because that exactly is where the ACL should be. If it's an acute patient, you can actually see that footprint there and try and make sure that your ACL sockets are within the footprint, both on the femoral and on the tibial side. The next cause in technical is insufficient graft material. So if you're doing a patient's ACL and you find that that quadruple semi-T is insufficient, please think of adding a grassless to it. There are many studies that show you that the mean load to failure is relative to the diameter. And as we increase our diameter from seven to nine, you will have a significant increase in your mean load to failure. More importantly, sometimes we feel, how much of a difference does it make when we make our 7mm to an 8mm or our 7mm to a 9mm? Well, it makes a significant difference. As you can see here, as soon as we move from a seven to nine, the cross-sectional area is significantly more, almost 62% more, and the increase in strength also is about 35% more. So I think that you should, at least when you're using a hamstring tendon, have a graft that's at least 8 mm in your root standard patient. And if it's a larger patient, it should be a 9 or a 9.5 or sometimes even a 10. Inadequate notch plasty. So sometimes you'll note that some patients have a congenitally narrow notch, a stenotic notch. And if you don't identify that and you don't do a notch plasty, your secondary impingement because of that narrow notch is likely to cause attrition on your graft and your graft is likely to fail. So identify the notch and do a notch plasty in the indicated scenarios. And of course, tensioning and graft fixation. If you haven't tensioned your graft well, you haven't fixed it well, this kind of a fixation is, of course, going to be a day one sort of failure. The next is biological failure. So here you've done your surgery well, but your graft hasn't healed. And of course, we saw this very commonly uh, uh, 15 and 18 years back when the Lars ligament was popular. But we see this nowadays when we've started, so we've started using allografts since the last nine years now, and we do see the rare case of failed ligamentization with the allograft, uh, cadaveric allograft ligaments that we're using. This can also happen with autografts, so you need to be aware of this and look out for this as one of the causes for failure. Infection and arthrofibrosis is going to be covered in subsequent lectures, so I'm not going to touch on that at all. The third cause is traumatic causes. And in these, you can have two types of patients, those that fail early, that means before graft incorporation has actually taken place, that means before six or nine months, these are early traumatic failures, and of course, the late ones that can happen subsequently during sports. And in these early failures, there are two groups of patients that I think you need to be particularly careful about. One is patients who have a high BMI. We know that a high BMI affects neuromuscular control Patients who have a high BMI tend to recover their strength much more uh, 
Uh, it's a much slower process than in normal patients. So you need to be a little slow with these patients of a high BMI. Don't get them to start running, jumping early before ensuring that they've got their strength and they've got their neuromuscular control. The second is the enthusiastic adolescent or young male athlete who's really feeling normal long before his graft is healed and who's trying to do uh, stuff that's way beyond the capabilities of that graft at four months and five months. I think you need to be particularly careful of these over-enthusiastic young males. So these two groups tend to land up with early failures. But we also see very commonly nowadays late failures. So like this fast bowler, he's undergone an ACL reconstruction, right knee. This is done about six years back. He's back to competitive crickets in the last four to five years. He tries to go for a catch in his follow through. His spikes get caught, his ankle twists, his knee goes into hyperflexion with a vulgar sort of force and that snaps his ACL. So six years down the line, he snapped his ACL and this is a true traumatic failure of his uh, ACL. And when you And when you see this, and when you see this on arthroscopy, you'll note what it looks like. So this is a patient whose ACL has healed. So you'll note that that ACL is healed in there, and that's where it snapped. So you can see that there's good healing here, but that's a complete tear of that ACL. And so you may actually find true traumatic failures too. And these two tend to happen. And as per the Mars study, they happen in at least 39% of patients today uh, in, in this era. Another common cause of failure that we've seen in our series is failure by the primary surgeon not to recognize secondary instability. And there are multiple causes for that. It could be skeletal malalignment. It could be meniscal loss. It could be a varus or a valgus instability or it could be an anterolateral rotatory instability that's not being recognized. So like this patient, he's undergone two ACLs. The first was probably a transtibial. The second was probably a transportal, and he's still got a significant pivot shift and now can voluntarily shift and do a pivot shift too. A patient like this, if you don't recognize the anterolateral instability there and don't think of an extraarticular procedure for him, like uh, maybe an LET or an ALL, then this is likely to fail for the third time too. Varus and valgus instabilities, make sure that you identify whether the patient had a PLC or a posteromedial corner complex tear along with that ACL. And if that was missed, that ACL, which has been reconstructed, is going to fail. Excessive stresses are going to be put onto that graft because of inadequate capsule ligaments and when that fails, again, if you don't identify this and don't take care of this, you would have your revision failing too. So identify other ligament instabilities. Skeletal malalignment too needs to be identified. We know that varus malalignment puts excessive stresses on your ACL. And so if you haven't identified varus malalignment and you do just an ACL reconstruction, it's highly likely that over time, there's going to be a slow failure of that ACL and he's going to come back to you with instability, with a varus malalignment. And in these scenarios, it's going to be not just your revision ACL, but you must think of doing a proximal tibial osteotomy. And you may add a decrease of your slope at the same time, take care of that ACL insufficiency. Meniscus deficiency, again, in our series, we've seen that this is one of the major causes for recurrent instability. We need to recognize that the meniscus is a secondary stabilizer for the ACL. So normally, you don't have an ACL. Your meniscus there is your secondary stabilizer. That's going to be taking all that load. And over time, you'll end up with either a root tear or a ramp lesion or a longitudinal tear peripherally. And we know from many studies that if you've got a tear of just the ACL, you're likely to have an anterior translation of about 10 mm. But as soon as you've got a very significant anterior translation or you've got a pivot shift, you have to suspect that it's not just the ACL. Your ACL is gone and probably one of the menisci, 
most likely the lateral meniscus is insufficient. And if you don't take care of that insufficient lateral meniscus, then I think that you're likely to land up with failure again. So take this patient that we've revised. This is a revision ACL. His MRI prior to his primary ACL showed the meniscus tear, but for whatever reason, that surgeon opted not to repair it. You can see that that's an unstable meniscus, and this patient's come to us nine months after surgery with a failed primary ACL. I think that if you don't take care of these secondary stabilizers like the menisci, it's going to be putting a lot of excessive, unnecessary stresses on your ACL, and that ACL is likely to fail. So identify meniscus tears, especially root and ramp lesions, and repair these too during the revision. And if you have a patient who's undergone a total medial meniscectomy, when you're doing a revision, think of a meniscus transplant because if you don't have your, if you, your entire meniscus on the, that medial side is gone, then doing just that revision is not going to give them stability. It's going to have to be an ACL reconstruction with a transplant. And finally, excessive posterior tibial slope. We know that there are numerous biomechanical and cadaveric studies today that suggest that an increased posterior tibial slope results in increased forces on not only the native ACL, but also an ACL graft. So I'm not suggesting that if your patient has an increased tibial slope in the primary situation, think of doing an ACL slope correction with your ACL reconstruction. But if you get a patient whose ACL reconstruction has failed and you find that he has an increased tibial slope, please look for it, identify it, and do discuss with your patient that you probably require a slope correction because otherwise your revision ACL is also likely to fail. So like in this patient who had a virus with an, uh, decrease, with an increased tibial slope, we've had to go ahead and do a slope correction with a medial opening wedge osteotomy. And finally, the patient factors. So we know that oh, there's some high-risk patients, obesity, hyperlaxity mm -hmm. with genuvalgum, patients who have poor neuromuscular control, these are all causes for reconstruction failure. And there are numerous studies which show us now that the in, amongst the intrinsic factors, there are anatomic factors, and of this, I think BMI and hyperlaxity are the most important. So these are risk factors for non-contact injuries of the ACL. And I think in India, this is particularly important because we know that 73% of urban Indians are overweight. And if 73% of our urban Indians are overweight and almost half of them are obese. A lot of them are going to come in for ACL reconstructions. And if we don't take care of that obesity factor, at least don't counsel our patients or don't protect them, then we will have a significantly higher number of failures. And this failure rate is also documented really well. And as we can see in this cohort study from Sweden on 30,000 patients, They've seen that young age and high BMI are predictors of early failure after a primary ACL. And what you can note out here in men and in women, as soon as the BMI goes from 25 to 30, your incidence for failure is significantly more than if your BMI was normal. Surprisingly, if your BMI is more than 30, that incidence falls down. But I suspect what happens here is, you know, these patients are so large that they're probably not going to run and jump. Whereas the guy who's between 25 to 30 thinks that he's fit, he's going to be trying maybe, you know, uh, fitness regimens that involve him running, jumping, twisting, and that's why he has a high incidence of failure. And we can also see this in patients who are adolescents. So if you have an adolescent with a high BMI, then you can see here yeah, that rate goes really, really up. So male adolescents with a BMI between 25 to 30 the failure rate is high, as high as 6.57. So this is a factor that needs to be identified and probably addressed. The second factor is the effect of preoperative knee ligament laxity. So patients who are hyperlax, again, have a significantly higher rate for failure. So you need to identify them. And for these high-risk individuals, you need to think of something else that you're going to do besides your ACL reconstruction if you're going to be preventing them from failing. So very quickly, we've seen the causes of ACL reconstruction failure. These could be technical, biological, traumatic, failure to recognize and address secondary instability and patient factors. 
So when you get a patient whose ACL has failed, try and see which one of these factors or which combination of factors has caused this and address these before you do your revision ACL reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Dinsha. That was uh, excellent. Parag, uh, any questions uh, from the attendees? Yes, there have been uh, some questions uh, uh, which have come to me. So yeah. one of the questions is, uh, Dinsha spoke about the graft size. So what is the minimum size of the graft you should have when you do a primary ACL reconstruction? So I think it depends on two factors. One is the size of the patient itself. So you can't have one size fits all. So you could have a very small, short lady, and for her, maybe a 7.5 is going to be adequate, but I wouldn't want to go to a 7. It would be a 7.5 or an 8. But if you've got a larger patient, you've got a patient who's going to be going back to sports, and you're doing your typical ACL reconstruction without any remnant preservation, I think you should be looking at an 8.5, a 9, or maybe even a 9.5. Okay. 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 Andy, a question for you. What should be the minimum graph size for a revision ACL? Uh, well, I'll cover that in my talk. So, Perfect. So okay. It all depends. You can get too big. You can be too small. Okay. Parag, any more questions? Yeah, there are two more questions. Uh, Dinsha, you spoke about ligamentization. The question is, uh, how does uh, the post-op protocol and what should be the post-op protocol so as to not uh, damage the graft before it ligamentizes. So the, what's the correlation? So that's the question for you. I think the whole rehab, I mean, that, that, that's a topic on, its, on itself. So your whole rehab, especially in the initial phases, is being done so that you regain your strength, you regain your range, you regain your neuromuscular control without putting excessive stresses onto that ACL. There's a lot of talk now on dynamic ACL bracing to ensure that you can do that without putting too many stresses on the graft too. But you certainly don't want your patients twisting, turning, and doing uncontrolled sort of activities before eight For to nine long? months. For eight For to nine months. months. Yeah. Okay. Anything that they should not do in the first eight weeks? Uh, a lot of things that they shouldn't be doing in the first eight weeks. Yeah. So Anything uh, related to weight bearing? No, I think weight bearing, there's no problem at all. So if it's an isolated ACL reconstruction, uh, you can allow them weight bearing immediately. Weight bearing is not the problem. It's really the twisting, turning sort of forces. It's also trying to do too much of an open chain that's going to put stress onto the ACL in the first uh, few weeks. Okay, so there's a last question uh, from one of the viewers is uh, the tibial slope. So he says that the tibial slope is a patient factor. So it cannot be like a secondary factor. So if the, the, if the slope can vary from four degrees to 11 degrees, the native slope. So if you see on a pre-op x-ray that the slope is uh, quite high, so how does that impact your primary ACL? Or what uh, were you talking? Was it like uh, because of an osteotomy that have you created the increase in slope or just little clarification? No, on that so I think there are physiological differences in the slope and between six to nine would be considered normal on the medial side. But as soon as you've got a slope of 12 or 15, which is a normal sort of pathological variant of that posterior slope, that ACL is gonna be put through a greater stress. Now, I don't think anyone's advocating a slope correction osteotomy primarily in these patients. I think that's probably a zone that we haven't gone to as yet. But certainly, if your primary ACL has failed, you're going to assess the slope. And if your slope is, say, 15 degrees in that patient, and you've already had a failure once, I think you need to not only be aware of that, but you also probably need to correct that. Because if you don't correct that slope, the possibility that that patient's going to come back with a second failure is extremely high. So for me, one failure would be enough to correct the slope. I think some people feel maybe a second failure because the slope correction osteotomy is a, a significant procedure. It's not just a soft tissue procedure. But certainly, you need to identify what that slope is and identify whether this patient falls into the high-risk group or not. OK, great. So those are the only three questions we had. The last one was from Dr. Uh, Mendranath from Varanasi. OK. Uh, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Sure, Arup. Uh, Dinsha, very elaborate, nice talk. 
but as you know, even the graph size also is all patient factor. Sometimes the graph is not uh, adequate as to your expectation. What are the tricks you have? You do this internal brace and what's your comment on that? Please? Okay, so I think graft is, it's, it's of course a patient factor, but there are many things that you can do. So for instance, say you've taken your semi-T and your quadruple semi-T turns out to be seven mm. Don't accept that seven mm. I think that you should probably take your gracilis, make it into a five bundle graft, make sure that your seven mm is now converted into a nine mm. So you could do it as a triple of a semi-T with a double of the gracilis and make it a five bundle graft or make it a six bundle graft, but don't accept that seven mm. So I think that's a technical part too. If you've identified beforehand itself that that patient is thin, and you can do this on an MRI, you can measure what that, and you can predict how the hamstrings are gonna be. Maybe hamstrings is not the best option for that patient. Think of taking the patella tendon and doing a BTB of nine mm or a 10 mm and use that as your graph for a quadricep tendon graph. So I think that that's also a technical part to it. Uh, don't accept a graph that's too small. Your second part of the question, should we do an internal brace? Uh, I don't think an internal brace can substitute graft size. I think that whatever literature is there would tend to show you that an internal brace is like a seat belt and that may protect your graft for some amount of time. Uh, it's not gonna change the fact that your graft is still gonna be a smaller graft. And I think that that is still gonna make it prone for failure uh, in the uh, in the athletic patient. Can I ask you a quick question? So last question we'll have, and then we go to the next talk. Yes, Neil. Yes, next so we know that in the Indian population, there's a significant amount of physiological variance. So what is your cutoff to actually ask the patient to consider an osteotomy as a primary setting, not in a revision setting, but in a primary setting to offer them an osteotomy when you're doing it as the first go? For varus or for posterior tibial slope? For, for varus. Okay, so for a posterior tibial slope, never. But if I find that if uh, uh, you know there's a varus, I think you need to see many factors. Number one, is this really an athlete or is this a middle-aged patient? He's a middle-aged guy with a varus and he's got an ACL uh, tear. I would probably offer him at that same stage an ACL reconstruction with a uh, medial opening wedge, high tibial osteotomy. If it's a younger patient who's an athlete, he's a footballer, he's got varus knees, he's got an ACL deficient knee, I'm not gonna offer him a first stage medial opening wedge osteotomy. You convert this guy who's got genuvarum into an alignment on one side, his other side still got the varus, he's gonna lose his ability to play football. So I think you need to see the full picture. And in a particular patient, you're gonna offer them osteotomies if it's really, really indicated. I know it, it gets you know, it gets a little controversial. So on the one hand, you're saying that if you've got say a seven degree varus in that primary ACL, excessive forces on that graft, it's probably gonna fail. But if he's a competitive footballer, are you really gonna be doing an osteotomy with an ACL? So I think you need to look at all of that and then decide uh, whether an osteotomy is gonna be done primarily or not. So there's no objective criteria. It's it's the overall picture that we're looking at. I think it's the overall picture. You're seeing many different uh, uh, factors all at once. Right, thank you. Okay, perfect. So excellent uh, uh, talk, Dinsha. Lovely. We thank you. Sachin, over to you. Unmute, unmute. Perfect. So that sets the tone for this uh, whole uh, webinar on revision ACLs. Dinshaw sort of uh, got us to exactly why the ACLs fail. And I think it's a great pleasure to invite Dr. Andy Williams now to discuss and look at his technique as to how he tries to prevent uh, doing a two stage and his tips and tricks to sort of um, do a single stage ACL, of course, in a non-infected situation. Andy, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen or not? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Ashok. Um, Just press the share screen, which you will see. You got that? Press, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. Make it full screen now. Okay. Lovely. We can, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. 
Perfect. You got it. So, okay. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. I wish I could see your faces, but uh, you can understand the current situation. So this is a picture of London I took back in 1976 when the uh, sun last shone here. Now, two-stage revision ACL is really unattractive to the patient. It's usually three to six months between the two stages. And if you're a professional athlete, that may actually mean that you lose another season. For, that, for them, that could be career ending. It's more expensive, there's more morbidity. And I suspect a lot of surgeons do two-stage procedures as a reflex decision. They don't really consider whether a one-stage is possible. Now, of course, the truth is I do do two-stage procedures. I've even published on it. In this example on the right, you can see a huge defect in the tibia. The only answer here is a bone grafting first stage and a second stage revision. But the truth is I do very, very few two-stage procedures. If you look at my series of 204 patients in that um, time period from 09 to 17, only three of them were two-stage. So you've got to realize my practice is really unusual. And you could say that this is a, a very dangerous talk. But at the end, I will present my data on results because I felt duty bound when I realized how unusual my practice was to check it out. Now, these are the prerequisites for getting a good result for any reconstruction, uh, primary or revision. You need a good graft. You've got to put it in the right place. You've got to fix it properly. And then you've got to think about how you minimize the stresses. Now, if you've got a posterior slope that's high in a primary setting, you probably wouldn't do an osteotomy, but then you might add a tenodesis to try and offset that increased risk. And there are various options you can see listed here and Dinshaw covered most of those. When you plan for a revision procedure, you've got to work out why the primary case failed because you don't want to repeat mistakes. And you've also got to think about the previous graft type. Patella tendon is a great graft to revise because the bone blocks mean that you rarely have problems with loss of bone, whereas soft tissue grafts can be more problematic. You've got to look at the fixation devices, the type of them, where they are, whether you can you should remove them, whether you can ignore them if they're too far out of the way, which is, it makes life easy. If they're absorbable, of course, you can drill through them, but you do scatter debris. And there is some thought that maybe that's a reason for tunnel widening in revision cases uh, if you've done that. Uh, you need to assess the previous tunnel size and position and I'd always get an, a CT scan prior to surgery and then you've got to choose your graft. Over the last 10-15 years I've been using that algorithm that I've uh, created and hopefully we'll have this uh, published in print very shortly. We've got a paper being reviewed at one of the big journals at the moment. And so there's a thought, a thought process which I like to apply. So the first thing is about graft choice. An autograft is far superior to allograft. You can see the big increase in failure rate of nearly three times from the Mars group. And so I really don't like using allograft unless I've got no other option. <clears throat> and with various tricks that I'll show you, you can cope with a tunnel up to 20 millimeters diameter if you use um, bone blocks or a quad tendon or a patella tendon. Those blocks are square, so you've got the square peg in a round hole phenomenon. And you can also use large metal screws that can fill a void. Uh, hamstrings can be uh, tripled or quadrupled, and you can deal with a tunnel probably up to 17 millimeters with those, particularly combined with a, an interference fit screw. Allograft is attractive because you don't have to harvest, and also the bulk of the graft is big. But as I said, I, the failure rate is too much for my liking. I always add a tenodesis in every revision case. Now, there are various scenarios to deal with. First of all, the tunnels are nowhere near okay. Some of those ones that Dinshaw sh showed would be easy revisions, it'd be like a primary reconstruction, and you just create new tunnels. But do what, think about graph size. If you have a big graft, you have a big tunnel, and that'll get you closer to the original tunnel, and you may get conflict. So you don't want to overdo it. Obviously, you need a minimum size, and certainly in our patients in the West, a minimum of eight millimeters diameter for hamstrings would be what I wanted. If the fixation devices are out of the way, there's no need to remove them. So you can bypass them, it's quite simple. So this is a win. Another win is where the previous surgeon did a great job and the tunnels haven't widened. You can reuse those tunnels. Uh, there you've got to make sure you clear the soft tissue properly and you've got to make sure that you get bleeding bone in the tunnels by decorticating them using a curette or a microfracture pick to create bleeding. 
Now we get into the difficult scenario, the first of the two difficult ones. What about very widened tunnels? Well, you can use a big graft, and we've talked about multi-strand hamstrings. You can use the bone blocks on a patella tendon or quad tendon. You could use allograft. The only downside of a very big graft is the risk of uh, impingement in the notch, and so notch plasty becomes regularly required for this. You can use large metal screws to fill voids, and you can use those screws to push the graft eccentrically within a large tunnel to the position you want. Occasionally, I'll do an acute allograft bone dial grafting, and then drill through those, gra those grafts in a one-stage procedure. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And never forget on the femoral side, the over the top position is a good option. And really it's the tibia that's the problem. So here's a professional rugby league player who's had three previous ACLs in this knee and he's coming towards the end of his career and he will not have a two stage procedure. He just says he can't cope with, he needs another contract. So I looked at the axial and I thought, well, it looks like there's three separate drill holes here that come. And I was able to fill those two anterior ones with bone graft and then use the posterior uh, as my new tunnel. So here is his knee. I've taken a big teletendon graft and uh, I've got these bone dowels into crest fit. I've held them with K wires, transfixed them into the joint and you can just see the tip of the K wire here. And then I've, with a guide wire, very, very gently drilled up to get a new tunnel. And then I've pulled my graft in and then when I'm happy with it, I've fixed it. Through sat in the front, pushing the graft back to where it needs to be so it doesn't impinge, and then bone graft either side, filling that, those anterior chambers. And so if, you, if you're really rigorous with your surgical technique, you can get great results. This guy played at nine months post-surgery, so it saved his career and he got a new contract. What about this option? Because this is uh, also problematic. If the tunnels are good, but they're just not right, what are you gonna do? Well, one option is to use the same tunnel, but deliberately move the center of that tunnel by reaming eccentrically. Now, the price of that, of course, is an increased tunnel diameter, but you can fill that space with a large graft or, and or a metal screw pushing it where you want it. Again, the rectangular bone blocks from quad tendon to tendon have a, a square peg and a round hole effect. And on the femoral side, you can still use the over the top position. So again, it's the tibia that's the issue. So I'll take you through the tibial tunnel scenarios. What about the excessively anterior tunnel? Well, obviously you get notch against graft impingement, the graft fails. This is an easy situation. You just ream posteriorly. So you create a bigger tunnel and then you, the graft will be against the back wall of the tunnel and you place a large anterior screw to fill that void. The real problems when the tunnel is too posterior, which creates the vertical graft that Dinshaw showed, <coughs> If it's more than 10 millimeters excessively back, that's not too difficult. Just to drill a completely new tunnel. And as long as your graft isn't too big, it won't conflict with the other tunnel. The big problem is when you've got an excessively uh, posterior graft that's um, more than 10 millimeters posterior, uh, sorry, less than 10 millimeters posterior. What are you gonna do then? Well, if you ream anteriorly and try and get your graft to sit at the front, as soon as you bend the knee, the graft will fall backwards. So that's not gonna work. You could use a very long screw, but the problem is the graft's going to impinge against the tip of the screw, abrade and fail. So maybe this is a case where we should consider a two-stage procedure or possibly use acute bone grafting as I showed you earlier on. Fixation is very important. I frequently use double fixation. So on the tibial side, I use an interference screw, plus I take the sutures from the graft and the, around a posting screw or suture anchor. On the femoral side, I always have an interference screw to, to push the graft where I want it. If it's a soft tissue graft, I use an ender button. If it's a patella tendon or quad tendon, I'll take the sutures up around the staple I use for my Macintosh tenodesis. So you need a stable graft for healing. My experience uh, is shown here. We've looked at this seven year period, 94 cases and 93 patients from my private practice and nearly half of these are my for my elite athlete population. I was the primary surgeon in just over a quarter. And in one in five, this was a second or subsequent revision. So quite a difficult group. And most of them are male, as you expect. Soccer and rugby were the main um, sports. And we looked at fairly crude outcome in terms of whether the graph survived or failed. 
and had to be revised, whether and what their um, patient um, the, the problems were, the patient uh, reported outcomes, and also if they were athletes, how long it took to get back. And we got 100% follow up on these guys, a minimum of two years, mean of 4.3. And 90% of these have meniscal and chondral damage at the revision procedure, and it's a pretty badly injured knees. <coughs> four were, uh, four unfortunately re ruptured, so that's a 4.3% failure rate occurring at a mean of 1.6 years. 25% uh, nearly had to have further procedures. So it's, it's hard work, this. Uh, mainly, it's simple things like meniscectomy or removal of metal, thankfully. One of them got infected, but in fact, it was the adjacent osteotomy that got infected, and thankfully that cleared by removing the plate because it already united. So we got away with that one. Now, the reason I did this study was because I knew that my practice is very unusual and I didn't want to be irresponsible. I need to look after my patients. And as you can see, the results for Tegner and Coos were actually very good and very comparative to all other series of revision ACLs. So that's very reassuring. And what that tells us is that if you're really rigorous with your planning, assessment of the patients, and you really make sure your surgery is perfect, you, only a minority of revision ACLs need to be done in two stages. Um, I've got an important disclosure amongst my four disclosures here, and that is that I'm a shareholder and a board member of Innovate Orthopedics, a small startup that makes metal interference screws. I've got a strong bias to metal, I can explain another time, but <clears throat> um, that is, puts me at conflict with, with this talk. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, Andy. That was indeed a complete eye-opener with a fantastic demonstration of uh, a, a good way to sort of you know, circumvent yourself around this odd situation. Uh, Parag, any questions on this from the attendees? Yes, yes. so there's yeah. a, a question which a couple of people have asked. Uh, uh, the question is, what is the investigation protocol or the algorithm you need to do yeah. before uh, moving on to the actual procedure. So once you yeah. see a patient, what is the investigation protocol? So the first thing is never forget that grafts fail because of infection. So I often do bloods, send fluid for culture beforehand. And at the time of surgery, send specimens. And if there's any doubt, you're gonna do a two-stage procedure. In terms of the um, clinical examination, you've got to beware missed peripheral lesions like a postlateral corner, as uh, we heard earlier on from Dinshaw's talk. And then the x-rays are very important. I get long leg alignment films uh, in most cases, if I've got any doubts about overall coronal alignment. And my, my standard series is uh, both knees on the same film for an AP, lateral of both knees at 30 degrees flexion, then patellofemoral. And I also get shus views as well, if I've got any doubts about articular cartilage. And then in every case, I get a CT scan as well. Um, if I'm worried about odd things, uh, then I might get a spec CT scan. I find that very useful in my uh, practice. And if I'm really chasing an infection, a white cell label scan as well. But the reality is nuclear medicine, I don't use very often for re revisions. But of course, you can get a CT scan with that. So, you know, if you've got any doubts, then add on the nuclear medicine part of it. <clears throat> okay, any more questions, Parak? Yeah, so there's a question from Raju Ishwaran. Uh, his question is, what is uh, Dr. Andy Williams' opinion about tibial tunnel drilled from the anterolateral side in revisions? So um, yeah, I got you. Sorry, I was a bit slow. Um, just recovering from the virus, guys. My brain isn't working. Um, that, I, I think that that's an option, but you've still got to get make sure that your internal aperture is where you want it to be. So the reality is it's a neat trick if you're going to drill a new tunnel. Although, in truth, if you can place a new internal aperture away from the old internal aperture, then you could do it from the medial side, side by side. And the other problem, if you come from the lateral side, you've got yet another angle around which the graft is uh, having to cut turn. And so on the lateral edge of the graft, you're going to get quite a lot of force. But it, no, it's a, it's a very reasonable option. But I think um, if you're able to get an internal aperture that's away from and doesn't conflict with the internal aperture of the old operation, then you can almost always do that from the medial side. So, <clears throat> one last question. So is it always necessary to consider a lateral extraarticular tenodesis procedure in revisions or is there any particular uh, protocol you follow that you might not do it? Uh, I, I always do. Um, as you know, I'm quite a big proponent of lateral extraarticular tenodesis. I, I don't believe in ALL full stop. Um, and 
I, can, I don't believe there's a great downside if, if the surgery is done properly. Now, it does add to the surgery and it slows the recovery a little bit. But in our data from uh, over 100 patients of mine, we've not seen any loss of range of movement. And we've seen a significant improvement in positive pivot shift. I'll get goods group, the stability trial last summer won the Donahue Award at the AOSSM. And as it been published recently in American Journal Sports Medicine, showed a significant reduction in rupture rates. Now, there's a lot of debate about this concept of over constraint, and people are a bit naughty and abuse that word without really explaining what they mean. Because as soon as you hear that word, you're thinking osteoarthritis. Do they mean you lose range of movement? Do they mean that you lose a couple degrees of terminal internal rotation? Well, I don't think those things matter. Do they mean that you're fixed in external rotation, you've got a contracture? Well, that's probably a bad thing. And we've shown in the laboratory that if you do fix the foot, out, the tibia out, sure, that's bad, you increase contact pressures. But if you do the surgery properly and use it as a check rein, then uh, rather like an MPFL, then uh, we could, didn't see any increased contact pressures in our studies. And we'll have, we've got to follow these patients up. But a biggest driver of osteoarthritis and ACL surgery is instability. So if you get rid of instability, you're a long way towards preventing OA. So uh, I'm very cool about uh, tenodesis, done properly, but you have to do it properly. Dinsha, you wanted to ask a question? And do you have a preference for the metallic screws over the bioabsorbable screws? So could you tell us the reason for that? Is that only in uh, revisions or is that primaries and revisions? And what's the reason? Um, I... It's safe, you know where it is. Uh, the only trouble with metal is having to remove it for revision surgery. But if you do a primary thinking about revision, there's probably something wrong with your mindset. <laughs> the truth is you can drill um, titanium screws. Mark Miller's published on this. Titanium is soft and drills made of stainless steel. So you, if you're really in trouble, you can drill through, but you've got to then work hard to get rid of the metal debris. But I, obviously I've now got a bias because I've, got, I've designed a screw and I, we sell the screws. So you must realize I have bias, but um, I, bioabsorbers rarely do what they're meant to do. P patients love the the idea of bioabsorb becoming bone, it just doesn't happen. It leaves a void full of soft tissue. Some patients react to them, they get tunnel widening and cysts. They're really expensive. They often have a matte surface. So as you just put the screw in, it spins the graft. They're brittle and break. You know, there's many reasons why I don't like it. I think peak is a very reasonable alternative, but it's pretty expensive. And obviously it's got the advantage of you can certainly drill through peak a lot easier. So maybe peak is the answer, but. Uh, I've got a strong preference for metal because I think it's safe. We know what we got. Yeah, Andy, there's a question from uh, Dr. Chirag from Bangalore here. Uh, the question says is that, do we have any data on the failure rates of an extra articular tenodesis for the primary situation and in a revision situation? So does an extra articular tenodesis fail? And if so, what percentage? Yeah, so... Uh, I can't tell you the percentage. I, I didn't look at the literature before. So I'm sorry, I can't tell you, but it's out there. I'll get good study is probably the best study. It's a multi-center trial, large number of patients. They only did a tenodesis in patients who were high risk, i.e. big pivot shift, et cetera. And they were young patients. So they're the ones you can tell a difference in. And they had a, a really significant reduction in re-rupture rates of their intra-articular graft. But when I've um, had a failure a re-rupture of the uh, intra-articular graft, I will revise my tenodesis. And where you've taken that strip of tissue, it's filled in and you can re-harvest. Okay. So if the pivot shift has occurred, and you see that from the bone bruising, that must mean that as well as the intra-articular graft failing, the extra-articular must have allowed that abnormal movement to occur. So I, I assume that means it's failed. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, two more questions from my side. Yeah. Dr. Millen from Nasik uh, has a question that if you bone graft with allograft dowels and do a single stage, does your rehab program change? Uh, I haven't changed it. Um, you just, you basically are effectively achieving everything you would in a good primary reconstruction, but you just have to work hard and make sure. So I really want to absolutely rock solid fixation or use double fixation on the tibial side. And, um, but I don't change the rehab because the reality is in activities daily living, the ACL is probably acting more like a proprioceptive organ than a, a 
um, re restraint because the ligament's got a little bit of give in it. And so for those activities, you really aren't stressing the graph very much. And uh, one last question here. Again, this comes from Dr. Bhupesh Karthik. His question is that when you fix a revision with a metal screw, will it give any problems with graft healing because there's metal in there and you're pushing the graft? So Yeah, so will any screw would be the same effect, I think. You reduce the surface area of contact between the graft and the, um, and the tunnel. But it's, um, if you have adequate stability, it will heal. The key, I believe greatly in aperture healing, uh, we have published on this previously, a case of a guy had a discharging hematoma from his hamstring harvest site. And at six weeks, it was still discharging. We took a sinogram of that and uh, the dye went up the table tunnel through the knee into a popteal vein. And my boss at the time, Peter Myers in Brisbane, I was on my fellowship, took him to theatre, the screw fell out of the tibia, he pulled out the uh, graft and kept curetting away and washing and washing away. And eventually he realized his curette must have been going to the joint because it was going far enough. And when the water came out, the color it went in, he then put a scope in the knee and had a healthy ACL. Awesome. So this ACL graft from a, being a rod of tissue become a tube of tissue. And the guy had a perfectly good result um, at a year. We looked, did laxymetry and everything. So that's published in arthroscopy. But so I think the key is the aperture healing. And so actually probably our concerns about having a small amount of graft against the wall is not so important. Nature's very forgiving. Okay. okay. Sachin, one last question from my side and we go to your talk. Yes, please. Yeah, so this question is from Dr. Siddharth Agarwal from Chandigarh. He wants to know, it's slightly a different question. Uh, how do you, is there any way to predict a hamstring diameter thickness and the length preoperatively? Before you start the surgery, can you predict it by yeah. ways? I can't. Uh -huh. And uh, I've got better at getting bigger tendons because I'm much better at harvesting without soft tissue peeling off the tendon. But uh, there are some studies with ultrasound pre-op. Um, I think MRI pre-op, but I, um, I don't know the answer to the question. But, the, but my graphs now are bigger than they used to be, and that's because I... I actually triple routinely. So I have six strand hamstring ACLs, my routine. I do more notch plasties as a result, but they're bigger grafts. Um, and if I'm worried about graft size, particularly in small women, I'll go for a patella tendon graft. And uh, some of these, even the patella tendon grafts have to be small, but it is the best graft. You've got bone block at each end, which heals rapidly. You've got natural attachment of soft tissue to bone. And I can remember a little Nepalese uh, female registrar uh, at the hospital I did, it ended up, we only got a six millimeter graft teletendon, but it worked just fine. So if you're gonna have a small graft, choose something other than hamstring. Okay, I think let's move on. There are a lot of questions regarding infection, Sachin, which have come to me. So I think your talk is uh, coming up at the right time. And we have uh, now Sachin Tapaswi speak to us on infection in ACL surgery, right from prevention up to treatment. Over yeah, to you, Sachin. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Parag. And uh, infection probably seems to be the most dreaded of our problems. And the incidence, fortunately, if you look at situations when you're doing just a simple arthroscopy, luckily is between somewhere between 003 to 0.3%. And the variation in these can be from very simple superficial skin infections to even deep-seated septic arthritis. Unfortunately, when we look at the same situation after ligament or implant surgery, this will definitely rise to almost about 1%. And if we don't treat them in time, you're going to have problems of uh, movement as well as problems with chondral damage and arthritis. So the sequelae essentially that we are really concerned about, especially after ACL surgery, are going to be those of stiffness, contractures, muscle loss, muscle weakness, muscle atrophy, and of course of chondral damage and arthritis. So the main causes why you would get an infection after an ACL reconstruction would be if that particular sort of individual, say he's a sportsman, he's had a steroid shot, uh, you know, just to try and take him through the season. And then, you know, someone goes in and does a surgery on him just after the season. Or if there's improper sterilization, you know, the OR environment is not that clean. If you've got skin lesions and if you have supracutaneous sutures, all of them are very important causes. 
Steroids essentially have a very strong association and it's uh, important that if you have had a steroid injection, then you have a slightly higher risk of getting an infection as high as 0.6 to 1% at three and six months, which has been sort of published in this large Medicare population study uh, almost about five years ago. So steroid injections, if you have a patient who's had a steroid shot, make sure that you don't offer him surgery ASAP and then wait for a while and then do the surgery. There's been a lot of debate on what should be the best way to sterilize. In my practice, we do a plasma sterilization, which I feel is the standard of care as of today. Uh, I, we should shy away from using formalin chambers or using, uh, you should, we should use activated side solution with a lot of care. It has to be essentially marked properly and the soakage has to be followed right down to the T, so as to say. Sterile plastic camera covers can be used, but in a very interesting study that was published from the Singapore General Hospital, they looked at these camera covers at the end of the surgical procedure and almost about 70% of them had small punctures, which means that at the end of your arthroscopy, probably three out of four times, you have violated the sterility by using a so-called sterile camera cover and that gave you a false sense of security. These ACL infections will present almost one in four will present within the first two to three days. These are usually because of staph aureus. They will present any with the standard way which an infection would present with knee pain, swelling, warmth, and all this classic signs of inflammation. About three out of four will present in an insidious fashion, maybe around two weeks following the date of surgery. And they usually have subacute pain, swelling, maybe treated initially just with some NSAIDs and you know that may mask their clinical presentation. And usually the organism in them is going to be CNS or coagulase negative staphylococci. As Andy went through his uh, sort of repertoire or his algorithm of, infection, of, of investigations, pull out the presence of infection probably is the first thing one would want to do. And in, in essential to getting total blood counts and ESRs and a CRP titer, you want to aspirate the synovial fluid, which I feel is pretty important. So synovial fluid aspiration, I think is a very important aspect and that has to be done really properly. So what are the criteria that we used? And we looked at this publication and we were also a part of the infection consensus meeting, which was held in Philadelphia in 2018, where uh, I was a part of the sports group and the criteria, which will now get published in the next couple of days will be there for you to see. But these are the criteria which, uh, which should be used for aspiration. If you have a positive culture on your aspirate, if you have a purulent aspirate, if your cell count is more than 100,000, if you have more than 90% PMNs, then that would be a diagnostic for an infection. If you have an aspirate that looks turbid, which has a cell count, which is between 20,000 to 100,000, a PMN count, which is between 75 to 90%, if the glucose of your synovial fluid is around 50% of that of the serum level, that is highly suspicious. If your CRP is more than 150 at day three, that suggests an acute infection. If it's more than 20 at the third week, again, you should be suspecting an infection and looking out for the same. The treatment is pretty straightforward. You should not be wasting much time and you should do an immediate arthroscopic washout. If you're able to catch the infection within 24 hours of its starting, you can aim and hope for at least more than 90% cure rates, which is really, really important. And this has to be followed by an appropriate course of antibiotics. And you should have ideally an infection disease consultant to help you within the same. When you surgically debride all these knees, we prefer to do an arthroscopic uh, type of debrima, essentially because the morbidity associated with an open arthrotomy is quite more. You got to send fluid for all cell counts and cultures. You need to culture aerobic, anaerobic, and if you suspect mycobacteria or fungal cultures as well, your synovectomy should be complete. You should be looking at the suprapatellar pouch or both the gutters, and you should go to the back of the knee and do the posterolateral and the posteromedial recess as well. You have to irrigate with at least about 10 liters of normal saline, and you should be putting drains at the end of the procedure. Arthroscopically, you can stage your septic arthritis into stages. 
essentially i mean that's something that we all will look at but the key to remember is that in the first three stages where it is slowly affecting and infiltrating the synovium and leading to infective synovitis your excess will be normal and only when it reaches the stage 4 would you start getting bone erosions and cysts and that represents a chronic infection so here we have a case of a 34 year old male who has a two week history of an acl done elsewhere he presents with fever and swelling he was aspirated at uh, the index place where he had the surgery he is also uh, had oral antibiotics which was upgraded and is, he was not settling down and what he actually required was an arthroscopic synovectomy and complete clearance of all his hardware and even take down of his graft so essentially i have put up this case to show that you should not be waiting that late if this guy had an early washout as early as maybe uh, you know within 24 hours then his knee could have definitely been saved so what does data tell us data tells us that if you go in early you have a higher chance of retaining your graft if you go in late then you are able to retain grafts in about 77% of all people if you do your procedures correctly then you will have no reinfections and you will have a very good outcome and the last thing that you want to do is that you should not be hard and fast to retain your graft if you find that your first arthroscopic washout has not got the right results you should go in do a second procedure get rid of all the hardware get rid of your graft as well so this was how he was at the end of 6 months following his uh, arthroscopic debridement he has got a knee that is quiet he's got a lax knee because i've got rid of all his hardware and his graft as well and he seems to be quite content and does not want to have a second procedure in spite of having a knee that is clinically lax but he does not feel instability in his activities of daily living so he has modified his lifestyle now does not want to go back to physical activity and he seems pretty happy with his result the controversies that we all sort of get to talk about is should we aspirate repeatedly i think there is no role of doing repeated aspirations if you aspirate once you find you should go and wash it out there is no point in keeping on aspirating and covering up with antibiotics open arthrotomy or arthroscopy similar cure rates but obviously the morbidity is more with an open arthrotomy suction irrigation is an absolute no no because it sort of uh, establishes a fluid highway where you're putting in and circulating bad fluid which really does not work too well females are less likely to be infected which uh, was discussed previously hamstrings are more likely to have uh or get infected if you're younger and if you are on immunosuppressants you're more likely to get infected so the incidence as i did say is going to be around 0.5 to 1% and average of 1.92 procedures per patient are to be considered the real question is that do you retain your graft or do you sacrifice your graft and i think this all depends upon how early you go in and if your graft looks viable if the tension on your graft looks good and if your knee feels stable then you can retain your graft especially if you've done it in the acute situation if your graft looks non viable if it looks lax your knee is unstable then i don't see any reason to retain the graft and i would sacrifice those grafts in these instances so how will i prevent it i think we have good guidelines now the first is that you have to maximize the host by ensuring that he stops smoking you've got good diabetic control and you clip the hair of the skin don't shave it off and you all of course want to minimize the bacterial load by giving a chlorhexidine soap wash to these patients pre surgery using an alcohol based chlorhexidine skin solution during surgery use prophylactic antibiotics and of course have meticulous soft tissue handling and closure techniques which will help the vancomycin antibiotic soaked wrap is a very good way to minimize infections and essentially how do you make this antibiotic wrap you take about 500 mg of vancomycin powder you dissolve it in 100 ml of normal saline and then you soak your gauze piece and you wrap it around your graft while the tunnels are being prepared 
so your average amount of fluid that your standard gauze piece is going to hold is going to be about 7 ml and that will give you around 35 mg of vancomycin within it which is completely safe because this will not be toxic for your graft it will not be toxic for your cartilage as well vancomycin is preferred because it has a low allergy rate and it is less toxic than tobra genta or kefazolin and essentially by soaking the graft you're changing it from a piece of dead tissue to now an antibiotic delivery system which really works in the long run i looked at my personal data over the last 20 years of uh, doing acl surgery and essentially what i did find that the incidence of my own infections has gone down over the last 6 years after i've started using vancomycin so grafts in my practice so i think the uh, i would like to conclude by saying that we as surgeons have the responsibility to prevent infections and i think uh, the onus is on us by taking care of all the proper mechanisms and modalities to stop infection thank you very much thanks sachin that thank was you. a great talk uh, you covered all the aspects uh, should we go to the straight to the questions any of the panelists want to make any comments or uh, any questions andy yeah you have to unmute yourself first yes. yeah no a fantastic talk i covered everything really the one thing i would say is that in terms of coagulase negative staff it's a much much more difficult scenario not only do they present less ill they, they rarely have pain they just have big swelling usually they may have had a few swell which it will be but not always over 100 and the other problem is you can't always culture them your your lab has to work really hard so culture negative does not rule out infection and often cases come along for second opinion and the surgeon said well the culture was negative so i didn't wash it out well if the color you got any suspicion at all you must be aggressive with it wash it out do a synovectomy in all the cases and it's just if you leave it the white cell reaction the bacteria will eat the articular cartilage is a disaster so the coagulase negative stuff it seems to be now the most common cause yeah that's a great point i think and really mm. important for all of us to remember absolutely and also they they often are resistant to the standard antibiotic prophylaxis of cephalosporins so we've changed our antibiotic prophylaxis about 10 years ago which plus adding in the vancomycin wrap has made a massive difference we had a run of infections and it was terrible <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Dinshaw. Yes, Dinshaw. Sachin, what are your recommendations for the intra disaster where your graft falls on the floor? So, say you're doing your surgery, your graft falls on the floor. Uh, it's it's not unknown. What are your recommendations in that scenario? So, luckily, I haven't had uh, the opportunity to face that. But uh, the recommendations which we wrote up in the international consensus meeting. was that you should soak the graft in a triple antibiotic solution for 30 to 45 minutes before you use it again prior to soaking of it you have to wash it with 2 liters of normal saline and then pre soak and soak it in a triple antibiotic solution of polymyxin b um, uh, gentamicin and vancomycin and keep it for at least half an hour to 45 minutes before you can reuse it again you would reuse that graft again Well, I haven't had the chance to but if, be in that scenario. I think it's always the, better to be, uh, you know, well prepared. If that did happen, you don't want to start thinking of what am I going to do. Uh, uh, Andy, what would you do for that? Unmute, unmute, Andy. Yeah. I would, uh, I would uh, do an internet search to remind me what I should do. <laughs> I'm very impressed that uh, Sachin knows. Uh, I've got a very good scrub nurse who actually double bags the grub. Craft. So if we do drop it, it can someone can pick it up, and then we can take the bag out of out of the bag. Um, but oh, it's one of those things you live in fear of, don't you? Okay. Up there with wrong side surgery. I've never done it. Dinsha, it did happen to me once, and yeah. uh, I did. You know, within a second, I picked up the graft, and I, I washed it exactly what Sachin said. I used a, a triple antibiotic. Uh, it was a girl i remember she's 5 years down and so far so good no no problems at all that's one that's right uh actually you know russ warren had done a good study on this and uh, this is early 90s if i remember correctly so he dropped 10 grafts on the floor 
Hmm. And he kept them there for 30 seconds. This was an in vitro study, of course. So he dropped it for uh, 30 seconds and then cultured all of them. And 60% of them cultured positive. He then did the wash as a second stage. He did you know, different solutions and he washed all of those graphs and then cultured it. And 30% of those graphs still came positive for culture. So I think it's a little dicey. If your graph <laughs> falls down, uh, I would say change your graph. Graphers. Go to something else. Go to something else. Don't use that graft again. Sure. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Nilesh. Nilesh. Yeah. So for the sake of viewers, if you could quickly run across the panel and ask, what's the routine prophylactic antibiotic that they use for ACL surgeries and how many doses? So I'll start off. It's uh, kefuroxine, 1.5 grams an hour before induction, and then two more doses afterwards. Parak? Exactly three doses, uh, and uh, the patient goes home the next day. Arubagam? Yeah, same three doses. First dose on call to the OR. And I had an experience of dropping graph once. And it is the same thing what Sachin did and it was almost 10 years ago. Lucky enough, uh, no complications. Sandeep Biraris, what's your antibiotic prophylaxis? Uh, well, uh, like in case of uh, graft dropping on the floor. No, no, no. Uh, just so antibiotic like, prophylaxis. Uh, yeah, so antibiotic prophylaxis, I just give plain uh, cipaparazon. Uh, one dose and, uh, uh, on the day of surgery, one at night and one day next morning. Dinsha, what's yours? The same. It's the same. Same. Anshu? Uh, Cefuroxine, three doses. If penicillin sensitive, then vancomycin. Vancomycin. Andy, what's yours? Um, as I said, there's quite a lot of um, resistance to kefroxine from Quigley's leg. Yeah. I think we've... But you won those to go on the same day. Have you got me back? Yeah, we got you back now. Yeah. yeah. Great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So uh, three doses of kefiroxine, but we also had ticoplanin. We've done that for the last ten years. Okay. Because the resistance is certainly in the UK to uh, kefiroxine. Okay, Andy. There's a question that's come up. How do you differentiate bone loss or tunnel dilatation? for reaction from a bioscrew vis-a-vis -vis infection, okay? So you've got tunnel dilatation. How to differentiate whether it is from a bioscrew reaction or it is from infection? This question comes from Dr. Mukesh from yep. uh, Nagpur. It's a really good question. Basically, you've just got to keep infection in your head because if you don't, you'll talk it away as if it's just a reaction to the screw. And if in doubt, I would... Uh, in fact, I've got a case of this coming up. If in doubt, I'm about to do it. I'm going to take it. We've done the bloods. We've done a white cell label scan. Nothing's come back, but I'm just worried about it. So I'm going to take the screw out, clear the tibial tunnel, which is where we think the problem is, and send specimens to the lab. If it's fine, then I'll go ahead and revise it in one stage. But if it's not fine, then I'll be aggressively reaming it out, curetting it out, and doing a two-stage procedure. Perfect. Um, the answer is you don't know, so it's a very good question. So people will be always thinking and worrying about infection. Okay, so um, I think we'll go to Andy's fourth talk. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have come up. We'll finish your talk and then we'll have discussion at the end. Is that okay, Parag? Yeah, that's fine. Let's do yeah. that. Yeah, so Andy, we'll have uh, Andy give his fourth talk, the fourth talk for today, which is essentially on arthrofibrosis, a problem that is seen quite commonly but uh, really, we don't have a lot of answers as to how do we deal with this difficult topic. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but we've got your first talk up right now. Um, you should have a st stiff knee. No, no, you, we're seeing avoiding two stages. Yeah, strange. I've got some, let's try it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Andy, have we lost you? Can you hear me? His net is a bit 
unstable. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting back. Yeah, no, you're good, Andy. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So I, I don't like the word arthrofibrosis because I think it's far too frequently used. And it's often a damn good excuse for a surgeon who's got a bad result. The truth is that when people genuinely have arthrofibrosis, and they do, it does occur. But it's a global scarring of the whole joint. So all the she is pretty uncommon. I think there are some patients who I probably have one of these every two years or so. And it tends to follow surgery that loss of range of movement are due to mechanical pad scarring, as we'll talk later on. And actually, it's the fault of the surgeon. They shouldn't operated when the knee would need to get the knee right or the surgery was bad so i don't like that term after fibrosis because it's really really rare and most causes of loss of movement are other things it's an opportunity really before we get into the subject to understand some really key the so-called anterior interval is that space between the patella tendon and the anterior uh, tibia and with the knee extended, it's full of fat pad, as you can see on the picture on the left from a study we didn't publish 10 years ago. But with knee flexion, you can see how the fat pad is moved up from that position into the knee joint. So this anterior interval is full of fat pad and extension. Empty and flex. The whole area is incredibly dynamic. And that movement, allow natural movement into extension, largest soft tissue structure in the knee. Um, it's spared in starvation. Patients who die of starvation will still have uh, a healthy fat pad. So there's something unusual about the type of fat. It's also full of stem cells. So it tends to cause scar tissue. And it's also very sensitive. It's got highly innervated and it's a good source of pain. So the patient refuses to move the knee that hurts. Then the stem cells cause a scarring and you get a contracture. And so uh, we've recently done an anatomic study and biomechanical study on this, which we published in the European Journal. So if you've got a patient who's got a stiff knee, first thing you are got to do is exclude infection. We've talked about that already, but a knee that loses range of motion is infected until you prove otherwise. Once you've excluded infection, then you differentiate intra and extra articular causes for stiffness. On the right, you can see two pictures, a very rare case. Somebody was pushed into a plaster of Paris cast to try and get the knee straight. The artery to the medial gastrocnemus was kinked and they got ischemic necrosis of medial gastroc. And in fact, their fixed flexion deformity got worse until I released it, as you can see. But the majority of cases are gonna be intra-articular. And they're usually due to capsular contraction cases. Ligament contracture, medial I can understand don't understand the concept of ACL contracture. I think if ACL graft is in the correct to natural ACL, that would stop movement. If you have fractures that are malunited, the obviously the incongruous movement. But for sports surgery like ACLs, it's usually problems of cyclops, lesions, meniscus tears, or a badly placed tibial tunnel. But despite those mechanical causes, most common cause loss of extension in particular, but also tightness in flexion is a fat pad contracture. These x-rays are from a patient from 15 years ago. Perhaps the physiotherapy wasn't so good then. And you can see how the patella is pulled down post-operatively. And this was an old fashioned operation followed by old fashioned physiotherapy. And people used to talk about a patella tendon contracture. It's not the patella tendon, it's the fat pad that scars up and draws everything down. Here's an example of a cyclops lesion. You can see a big lump of tissue on the MRI scan here. And then you pop a scope in the joint, there's a big lump blocking the knee in extension. And that's a real win because if you, if you resect it, the knee comes straight. This is another example. And here's the cyclops. And you've got to resect back. And often when you're doing that, I used to get very scared, was I removing the graft? But when you encounter the graft, it really is very obvious. You'll see longitudinal linear fibers and you know it's time to stop. Often in these cases, you'll need to do a, a notch plasty and look for debris from surgery such as a bone that needs to be removed as well. 
So if it's genuinely a mechanical problem like a cyclops, then that's a really easy scenario to sort out. But with the cyclops, often you get a fat pad contracture because the two go together. And when you have a loss of range of movement, it's important to note that fixed flexion is far bigger a problem than poor flexion. And when a knee won't come straight, the problem is just about always at the front of the joint. It's only very late that you get a posterior capsular contracture. So the most important thing, of course, is to prevent it. And the si single commonest problem is the patient who has a fixed flexion deformity after an ACL never had a straight knee prior to surgery. And the surgeon has got to wait until that knee is quiet, which means full action not just passive, but active extension, little swelling and flexion of at least 100 degrees. You've got to do good surgery. You've got to put the graft in the right place. You've got to be rather atraumatic with your skills and you try not to touch the fat pad. Now, sometimes you have to, if it's in the way to see, but if you place portals high anterolaterally, then you tend to avoid it and you can do the whole surgery without touching the fat pad. The rehabilitation has got to be done right. I hate the phrase aggressive rehab. If people beat the knee up, it gets more angry and gets stiffer. It needs to be intensive, not aggressive. Often the people with stiffer knee, knees need time for prehab before the operation. And the sort of thing you'll do pre and post-op are patella glides, passively get the knee straight with prone hands, with stretches. And, uh, but more importantly is isometric quads contractions. The patient's going to drive the knee straight and I always tell them the pain they get in the fat pad region is nothing to worry about. You can drive through it. It will not cause damage to the knee because they're often frightened of that. If a contractor is established and you're in trouble, well, obviously carry on with physio, but there is some bracing that can help that the jazz brace as shown on the right involves half an hour sessions, three, two or three times a day. And every five minutes, the patient turns the knob and stretches the knee straight and slowly but surely with sustained tension the knee will come out straight, but not every patient tolerates that well. Manipulation for getting a knee straight just does not work. And serial casting is, is dangerous, as you've seen. I've seen nerve palsies, uh, full thickness, skin breakdown, etc., and it doesn't work. So a manipulation of serial casting for extension is not the answer. If you've got an established case, then we've got to do surgery. And the mainstay of surgery in all cases is a release of the fat pad. We'll show you that in a minute. And then if it's an established case and the knee won't come straight despite getting rid of the contracture, then you have to do a posterior capsular release. So what do we do? This is a picture of a lot of scarring in the fat pad. Normally the fat pad is yellow, as you know. Here it's white. And this is a very abnormal situation. That fat pad has lost its flexibility. It's like a door jam at the front of the knee. It won't get out of the way in extension. And it's a tether when the knee flexes. And so to release the fat pad, I take it usually a knife these days or a radio frequency probe and make a an incision right through the scarred fat pad anterior to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus just anterior to the intermeniscal ligament and anterior to the lateral meniscus and i sweep the knife or the radio frequency probe right down the front of the tibia i've never yet taken off the patella tendon but i i do that have that in mind i promise you and the scar is like a rind around the fat pad and you almost pop through it. There's tremendous resistance. If you use a shaver on it to resect it, but if there are big lumps of scar tissue, you do that. It's really tough tissue. But as you get through into healthy fat pad, suddenly your instrument flies through that tissue, whereas it's tough when it's scarred. So you've got to release that anterior interval, first of all, resect any scar on the fat pad itself. But sometimes when you've done all that, you're sure that there's nothing restricting extension at the front of the knee, it still won't come straight. And these are usually cases three or four months old or later after surgery. You have to do a posterior capture release. And this is a fantastic operation that very few people practice or know how to practice. Knee is placed uh, with the hip abducted at 90 degrees, as you can see, and make a post remedial incision over that soft spot when you palpate this area just behind the femoral condyle then make a medial arthrotomy and with sharp dissection, take the capsule here off the femur, and then cut the uh, gastrocnemus tendon off as well and proceed towards the midline. Obviously I'm aiming with my knife from posterior to anterior. I have a long handled blade to get as close to the bone as I can. As long as you stick to bone, you're safe. And then we'll get to the midline. And this is a picture taken with an arthroscope. Um, uh, illumination 
And you can see here the gastroc is off with the capsule. I've stripped the soft tissue off with periosteal elevator. And then here we can see the septum that sits behind the PCL. And this is the moment of truth. And that's where most surgeons get very nervous because here is the artery and the neurovascular bundle. So you have your longer handle blade. You aim from posterior to anterior and you cut on to the lateral femoral condyle to open this posterior lateral recess. And once you're in, you're safe because you can blade against the femur and you just peel off the capsule, you peel off the lateral gastroc, and you use a periosteal elevator to strip the soft tissues. And this really allows for even hyperextension to come back. This guy actually, for me, is a bit of a disappointing result. He's two weeks post-op, he had a septic arthritis with a, about a 30 degree contracture. And he was just off straight when I saw him in clinic at two weeks. Uh, he did actually get straight, thankfully, with physiotherapy, but we can expect really good results. It's obviously surgery that needs taken with great care, but it works well. What about poor flexion? Well, um, this is a place where um, physiotherapy can help. There's a jazz brace for this as well, which slowly flexes. It's particularly useful for knee replacement patients. But manipulation does work for flexion. You, it's pointless doing it if the knee is angry because it's, you get a result on the operating table, but the stiffness will come back. So you've got to wait for the knee to be quiet with that inflammatory response burnt out. And it's very important that you're careful doing it. You can fracture a tibia. I've managed to pull a tibial tuberosity off in a case. So you take both hands on the proximal tibia, both forearms up against the tibia, and then you spread your load as you lever it into flexion. And I put my ear up against the lateral aspect of the knee as taught by Peter Myers in Brisbane. And you listen to the adhesion Obviously, if there's a period of silence, if you push too hard, you'll do some violent damage. So it's time to stop. Um, we use a femoral nerve block so the quads don't fight um, flexion for, uh, for a day or two. So be very careful, you've got to mobilize with crutches. We use CPM. And I think the MUA is worthwhile, even in late cases, even months later, you can get a win with it. But nevertheless, there are some cases you just can't safely manipulate. And so they all need surgery. And the mainstay of this is an arthroscopic arthrolysis of the problems within the joint. And to do this, we give tranexamic acid beforehand because we want to minimize bleeding. Nature's glue is blood after all. And I use a narrow, sharp punch. Uh, there aren't many smiley knives available these days, but that's a fantastic instrument or a radiofrequency hook. And basically you, you slide it up against the adhesions. First part of the job is to recreate the soup to the pouch and you shove your smiley knife or punch uh, until the, you feel that it yields through the contracture. So you recreate the pouch and then you go down the medial and lateral gutters again, have the knee bent as, uh, over the side of a table and you shove back against the scar tissue until it gives on you. Uh, then you go to the front of the joint, you've got to open the anterior interval and resect any fat pad scar as I showed you. I try, as soon as I see yellow fat, I don't do any more resection. You've got to preserve the fat pad. Now, some old reports where you had to resect the natural ACL and PCL. I think it's absolute nonsense. I can't believe that. Obviously, if you've got a horribly anterior femoral tunnel for an ACL graft, that's different. But the natural cruciates, I would leave. I can't see any reason to take them out. Once you're sure you've cleared the contracture, then you manipulate the joint and you usually get what you want. But of course, there are some cases in which there's a significant extra articular contracture and you have a quadriceps contracture. And if you fail to get more adequate bend with um, the arthrolysis, then you flex, you'll feel the quads tight and you'll realize that's what's stopping further flexion. So I undertake a Thompson quads plasty. Uh, I center my incision on the middle of the patella, go proximally to the length of the rectus tendon. And then with diathermy, I cut the vastus medialis off the extensor mechanism, do the same for the lateral side. And then underneath the rectus femoris is the intermedius tendon. And that's like a rigid bar of scar tissue. So I put a knife um, between rectus femoris and the intermedius and excise that intermedius, which is a big contracture. And once I've done that, then I do a manipulation and you'll see that the vasti pull back away from the extensor mechanism. It's a wonderful operation. Again, it's not well known, certainly by European surgeons. So we don't have to do it too often, but it's a fantastic procedure. The, one, the method I use is Thompson 
procedure. It's written up in uh, Campbell's Orthopedics, but it's very simple, straightforward, and a fantastic result. So just to end there, my disclosure, disclosures again, none of them are relevant to that talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. That was a great talk. I think uh, excellent concepts with, uh, you know, a couple of them real eye openers uh, with uh, the surgical technique that you described. And uh, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Uh, I, um, Ashok has just told us that uh, we have around 4,000 attendees for today's webinar. So that's really great. And uh, there are about 150 questions lined up. So uh, I think, Parag, uh, uh, we can take about 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Is that okay? So I think we should do that. And first, let's take the questions immediately, which are pertinent to Andy's talk on orthofibrosis. And yeah. then we'll go with, there are some questions such in for the infection and you know, a few general questions. So uh, I have a few questions which have come for uh, uh, Andy. Uh, Andy, you spoke about the posterior capsule release. And uh, one of the questions is that, and you described the open method and it's a little bit risky, but you said that you stay close to the bone. So this question here is that, can we do it uh, arthroscopically instead of doing open by Prathimesh Jain? He, he wants to know whether this procedure can be done arthroscopically. No, I, I, I love more safer. I have been doing them arthroscopically recently, not enough to give you proof that it works. Uh, one was on a colleague of mine, actually. Um, Rob Laprade's written it up, but he only describes releasing the postromedial capsule. Uh, it's quite hard to see up, the, up uh, to that position, but it's possible. And you introduce the arthroscope via the intercondylar notch from the antilateral portal over the ACL into the postromedial recess. <clears throat> and then rotate the scope upwards and you can see the junction of the capsule to the femur. And then very carefully with, with um, radio frequency, you can elevate off the bone. And then with the scope and the anteromedial portal, uh, go just below the PCL into the postrolateral um, uh, recess and beg your pardon, ACL into the postrolateral recess and repeat the same via postrolateral portal. So you need a postromedial and postrolateral portal. The trouble is that you don't get to do anything to the midline. You can divide the septum behind the PCL, as I, I usually do with my PCL surgery, but I'm just a little bit scared of a neurovascular bundle with an arthroscopic procedure. Uh, the thing with open surgery is it's a pretty small scar. It's medial, so not seen, so cosmetically it's good. And I think you've got a lot more control. And um, I tend still to do open surgery, but I think that... An arthroscopic procedure is very reasonable, particularly if no one's ever had a go before. I think for revision surgery, I'd always do it open. So long answer, apologies. Oh, no. So uh, one more question is that oh, you, when you spoke just now, your uh, talk was more pertinent to ACL, uh, uh, post-ACL reconstruction, orthofibrosis. But do similar principles uh, uh, apply when you're dealing with post-traumatic, post-operative uh, knee stiffness? Absolutely. Or, or is there anything different you would do if you're having a patient upper end tibia who's operated with a plate and he has uh, developed a stiffness after the surgery? So anything different in these cases? Yeah, the principles are exactly the same. I'm, I didn't have time. To, to, uh, when I give the talk normally, I talk about the natural limitation to extension and flexion. And if you understand those, that's important because you'll know what you've got to restore. Um, but no, the principles are exactly the same. So if I have a knee replacement that gets stiff or post-trauma knee that gets stiff, number one, is it infected? You've got to ask yourself that question. And I've recently had a guy who's had a shocking uh, injury. He's a medical legal case, all sorts of trouble. Anyway, we managed to culture something at surgery. So he obviously had an infection that wasn't picked up at the time. And um, so that's the first thing. And then you deal with extension and flexion separately. Priority number one is extension and or prevention, I suppose, is priority number one. But number two is if you get a contracture, you've got to get that knee straight. And then once it's straight, you can deal with the flexion. You can rarely go for both at once because the rehab is different. And the problem is it, if you want to get the knee bending uh, quickly after surgery, then you need to have a knee that already comes straight. But the principles are exactly the same. Okay. So any other questions for uh, Andy Williams on this topic of uh, stiff knee? Yeah, I got a question, sir, Parak, sir. Yeah, sure. Please, Anshu. Uh, Dr. Andy, so uh, you talked about 
doing an aclr or rather not doing an aclr when the knee is very angry but now there are papers from sweden by carl eriksson and also from austria wherein they are doing acls within even 48 hours of the injury so what is your take on that you can do it if the knee is quiet and um carl is a friend of mine the guys in austria as well um but if the patient can't fully extend pre-op you're taking a real risk and unless you're frightened of the patient flying home and you lose the case um we see a lot of patients like this from the alps and also from america they should damn well not have surgery it's the patient the surgeon is doing it for commercial reasons they may not realize that but that's what they're doing and they're using those papers those papers carl is a lovely lovely man he's a friend but the People are misinterpreting. Because of my professional athletes, I frequently do ACLs within 48 hours of injury, but I also frequently tell them, no, I'm not going to operate for a month. And uh, I'm old enough and ugly enough now, I don't need the work. And they, have, they can see somebody else if they want the operation earlier. And that every now and again, even I have my arm twisted. 100% of the time I regret it. And then it, you're in for months of misery. And I've got a footballer I can think of right now, oh, about three years ago. It's just, as we say, a shit fest. And you can avoid it by explaining to the patient and working with the physios, get that knee quiet. And of course, there are some that can't get straight before we do the ACL. And they, they, need, they need surgery for fat pad release, uh, rem remove the ACL stump to get them moving before you'll agree to do it. I had a dentist who hated me, but it, it did the right thing. You know, I did, did that clearance at three months, or just before three months, and then delayed the ACL for another six months until she proved to me she'd keep it moving. So you've got to be strong, guys, girls. So it is the presence of knee extension and not the time of the surgery that's important, right? So I missed that. So the patient should have total knee extension. It does not matter whether it is 48 hours or eight days or three weeks. Exactly. And I would say active extension. If they can't fire their quads well enough to extend their knee fully, then I wouldn't do it. Passive extension is not enough for me. Okay. okay. All right. Next you. question. Yeah. So next question is for you, Sachin. Uh, the, the three, four questions. First is that once you've done a debridement and in, in, in a situation where you have to remove the ACL, uh, when is the right time to go in and do a revision uh, ACL? First is, I think I'll answer it in two steps. Uh, once you're very sure that all the blood values have come down, number one. Number two, his knee is quiet. Number three, he's got good strength. He's got good function of his knee joint. Those are the three criteria that I will consider first. That's part one. In part two, I'm going to look at his tunnels. So I'm going to see what sort of tunnel dilatation there is. And uh, that will sort of determine if it is a horribly infected knee, which has settled down maybe in about three months or six months, then whether I need to do a two stage or a one stage for tackling those tunnels, that's going to be my second consideration. So to give a ballpark answer, I think after the knee settles completely, the patient is off any form of antibiotic therapy, he has got uh, good, he's undergone good physical therapy. I'm going to wait for at least three months before even we start discussing redo surgery. Okay. Uh, anybody from the panel wants to add anything more, Dinsha, Andy? Okay. So oh, another question, Sachin, which has come up is that you talked about the vancomycin wrap. Yes. And you said you use 100 ml of uh, saline, normal saline. Yes. So, uh, is the question is, is Ringer lactate solution better than normal saline? Well, I don't think so. The reason being is that all the data that we have now is with the use of normal saline and vancomycin. I'm not very sure as to what happens to the vanc when we soak it in the Ringer lactate. So uh, I don't have any data on that. Andy has some data on using betadine soaked grafts. Does he still use them? Sorry, who was who that? Betadine you, soaked grafts. Do you, you, use would, you would soak your grafts in betadine. Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. No, I, I think it's probably 10 years ago we started using vancomycin. I was taught, in fact, by Tim Spaulding and Pete Thompson. They had an awful case. And 
they started doing the wraps, but also we, we changed our prophylaxis at the same time to add in um, ticoplanin. So the first time I saw you use betadine was when you were in Pune in 2013. And during a live demo, you actually soaked your graft in yeah. betadine. And I did happen to ask you why you're doing that. He says, I can't you hear all the tenocytes screaming that why are you killing me with COVID on ID then? You know, so, I don't, basically, I, I, I still splosh it. I keep sloshing betadine everywhere. I keep doing a lot of that. I can't uh, remember. I, I actually can't remember wrapping graphs. But you, not you, wrapping graphs, just, you know. I don't remember doing Layering them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions, Parak? Yeah. yeah. So uh, one more uh, question. Is there any situation, Sachin, uh, when that you've done a debridement, you removed the ACL, you cleaned the tunnels, and there is some kind of fibrosis which sets in and gives some stability to the knee. So, have you seen any situations uh, when you don't have to do a revision, even though you've removed the uh, ACL graft? So, if I follow up all the patients on whom I have done surgeries for infection, ninety percent of them have come back saying that they don't want surgery. I think probably they're too scared of it. 90% of them have not had a revision ACL. And probably I think they're too scared of it. They've had enough in life. They've reset their goals. And I've really actually done surgery only on about four or five patients after having had, uh, for whom I've treated them for infections. Is it and in, they are scared you're saying, or is it because they have inherent stability? So uh, it's, I think, a combination of everything. One is that, uh, you know, probably the slight amount of fibrosis that sits in the capsule maybe gives them some pseudo stability. One. Second is that they re reset their quality of life, definitely after having had an infection. And I think that whole process of going through two or three surgeries with deprivements and antibiotics probably doesn't want them to sort of venture near that. That's my that's my experience. Uh, Andy Dinshaw, Arun, your experience? I've only ever had to uh, sacrifice an ACL in one case, and he actually had recurrent infection, so I just took it all out. All the others, I've preserved the graft. Now, I noticed in the, one of those, that video, there's a lot of synthetic material in that graft from the suturing. If you've got braided synthetic tape or suture, you're never going to get rid of the infection, so you've got to I applaud people who've got the guts to take the graft out. But the reality is that I've, apart from that one case, never had to sacrifice the graft and we've got a result. My regime is, you know, if in doubt, I do a synovectomy, as you say, four portals at least, often six. I do use a minimum of 15 litres of fluid under pressure. And I do most of my surgery just to use a hand pump. I actually put a proper uh, arthroscopic pump in and power through high pressure at 150 millis of mercury. And then I come back at two days and I just wash out the blood clot that I've created. So it's a very, very thorough um, and aggressive approach. And is, you know, when you look at cases, when you're young, particularly or inexperienced, you try and talk yourself out of the reality of an infection and you leave it. Yeah. You, if in doubt, just do it. Yeah. And the problem after the surgery is the risk of stiffness, which is pretty much inevitable. But if the patients are educated well, if they work hard, it's not too big a problem. The other issue is that the uh, the huge white cell response with all the enzymes being left let into the joint to try and kill the bacteria softens the articular cartilage. So you've got to really look after the articular surface. So um, we often use CPM to try and nourish it and also keep the non-weight bearing for a few weeks. And if the fusion doesn't settle, we aspirate partly to check for infection, um, but also inject a viscous supplement in the hope that that might help the articular surface later on. Yeah, on the same note, Andy, there was a question, which was that, do you have any experience of using leukotrienes in the joint? Of using what, sorry? Leukotrienes in the joint. Um, no. A mast cell inhibitor. Yeah, no, I've got no, I've got no experience. I know there are one or two articles suggesting uh, a reduction in stiffness. Yeah. But I, those papers, I reviewed them, I mean, quite a few years ago, I reviewed them, but... <clears throat> excuse me, um, the data wasn't great quality. Um, the Mar Mark Philippon at the Stebbin Hawkins, Stebbin Philippon, sorry, uh, in Colorado uses a, an antihypertensive drug. And he believes you get less stiffness from that. But again, it's not, it's, it's orthopedic science rather than real science. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes, Parag. So, so one question to you, uh, Sachin, uh, regarding uh, you know prevention of infection. Is it better to do uh, ETO sterilization of your uh, cameras rather than using uh, a camera cover? So, so I have gone away from camera covers for maybe the last decade plus. Okay. I always, uh, previously I was using ETO and over the last maybe at least seven years, eight years, I'm completely on plasma. Okay. Uh, and I don't use camera covers at all. So Dinsha, your experience? I think most cameras can be sterile now, a lot can be autoclaved. So I think that's probably the safest. Yeah. Okay. Andy? Yeah, no, we're the same. We, we stopped using covers about five years ago. And uh, it, obviously different hospitals have different equipment, but ours are fully sterilizable now, which is fantastic. Sandeep, any uh, comments on that? What is your way of sterilization of yeah. cameras? Uh, sir, I do use uh, sterilization with plasma. Okay. Yeah, That's the work, uh, the place where Aru, I. Aru, anything different? Unmute. Unmute, Aru. Unmute, unmute yourself, Aru. Aru, you're muted. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Stop yeah. using uh, camera covers. Uh, so our uh, way of sterilization is a plasma. Plasma. Okay, so I think that's the consensus. So uh, that's the answer to the question uh, which came. Uh, one more question to uh, Andy. So Andy, in, in, in your primary ACLs, when do you decide that you want to do uh, extra articular tenodesis or ALL? I know you don't do an LL, but in a primary setup, when would you do a yeah. lateral extra articular tenodesis? So basically, whenever I'm worried, which means any under 16 year old, and for most primaries, I, I do a modified Le Maire I use a suture anchor to attach the IT band graft just proximal and posterior to the LCL attachment to the femur. And with x-ray control, you can get your suture anchor distal to the growth plate. So all kids get it, all immature skeleton. Big hyperextenders, that's quite a big risk factor for ACL. Um, those are generally rather loose. Those with a strong family history. Um, and in my elite athletes, guess what? I worry more, so I tend to have a lower threshold. And so basically any case I think is at risk. So we mentioned the malalignment issues of uh, varus or valgus indeed, or high tibial slope. Um, anywhere I think I need a bit of help, that's when I'm going to add it in. So a big pivot shift as well. <clears throat> so is your preferred method uh, anchor or do you use staples or tunnels? Right, for revisions, I tend to use a Macintosh with a uh, staple to fix the graft uh, on the distal lateral femur and the metaphysis. Uh, whereas... Uh, in primaries, I make a smaller scar, a shorter graft, and fix it very close to the LCL attachment for femur using a suture anchor. I guess the fixation is less good quality, but it's, uh, it's more cosmetic. Uh, I think it's adequate. Some people drill a tunnel at that point, Le Maire's point, but my experience is that once you've drilled more than 20 millimeters, your chance of hitting the femoral tunnel of the ACL is very, very high. I know people say you can drop your hand or you can leave a reamer in the tibia and do inflection, and I appreciate all that, but it seems to me, perhaps I'm just not good enough, but I, I hit the femoral tunnel very frequently. And if you use an ender button with a hamstring, that might mean you lose fixation. Okay. Uh, Sachin, a question to you that you spoke about infections and after doing a steroid shot, you should not do a ACL reconstruction. So what is the duration between a steroid shot, if at all the patient has got it, that you would defer your ACL reconstruction to? I think I would try and refer surgery for at least about anywhere between four to six weeks minimum. Four to six weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So how much time, Sachin, we have about, we have many more questions. Should we go for five minutes more at least? Or Yeah, maybe just wrap it up in five minutes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Two hours now. Yeah, I, I know. So Dinsha, the question is uh, to you now. Uh, you spoke about meniscal deficiency. So in case the you know meniscus can't be repaired and you have to resect the meniscus, how much resection of the meniscus is safe so that to avoid any instability or secondary destabilization of your ACL? Well, that's never really been studied. I think uh, if you're just taking out a few millimeters of zone three, probably that's not going to make a difference. But I suspect that's not going to be the case in a revision scenario. In a revision scenario, you're going to be left with a large sort of tear. 
repair whenever possible. Certainly the roots need to be repaired, the ramps need to be repaired. If you're gonna trim off some portion of the meniscus, you're gonna to have to ask your patient for some amount of activity modification subsequently. Because if you don't, you don't have your secondary stabilizer from the meniscus point of view, uh, that revision ACL is likely to fail in the long run. Okay. Uh, this question is from Sunil Apsangi to uh, Andy Williams. Uh, question is, when would you consider, if at all you do, uh, over-the-top femoral graft? Um, I've only, only done this once or twice before. And it's basically when we, the patient really wanted to have a one-stage procedure, plus they had a very large femoral tunnel. So and it's, it worked very well. If, um, and I think we, we tend, because it's viewed as old fashioned, tend to think perhaps it's not the right place to, uh, not right thing to do, but it's a very good option. We had this business with the so-called anatomic femoral placement in the center of the footprint. But in my experience, particularly my athletes, who are really gonna test their ACLs. I, I increased my re-rupture rate two and a half times for hamstrings and doubled it for tele tendon. So I've gone back to an AM bundle position. And if you look at that position, it really is pretty close to over the top. So uh, I think that, you know, Stefano Zaffanini from Bologna has published a big series with over top method. He also takes the graph over the top, but then down on the lateral side as a Tina Dices. And uh, it's a very useful trick. So on the femoral side, you can always do a one stage procedure. It's, the, as I said, okay. a tibia that's the problem. Uh, one more question to you, Andy, again on the uh, arthrolysis uh, uh, talk. This is from Dr. Sanayam Chaurasya, who is an orthopedist and an entertainer, he writes. I don't know what he entertains, but I could do with some entertainment, uh, Dr. Sanayam, uh, at this point of time. But nevertheless, coming to the question, when you release in the gutters, when you're doing your arthroscopic arthrolysis or adhesiolysis, what is your end point? How do you know when to stop uh, in the gutters or uh, in the patellar femoral joint? So it, it's a very good question, but you, you have your punch open and you push it. And as you push, you'll, you'll just feel it give as you go through it. So you push, it gives, move up a bit, gives, and you literally, you just feel it yield. And, and what you're doing effectively is you're unzipping the gutter up to the soup the pouch and then down the other gutter. And so you've got a single line of incision that separates the rind of scar tissue from, um, you know, so two layers of it. And if you think about knee motion, the extensor mechanism has to slide around the front of the femur. So you need an open pouch, but those tissues also have to slide around the medial lateral gutters. And so they have to be open as well. Okay. So Parak, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, and I'll, I'll get an answer. I'll ask, uh, I'll expect an answer from yourself, uh, Aru, Dinshaw and Andy. Is that uh, the situation is that you, uh, there is a patient on whom you've done an ACL reconstruction He's got, uh, he's uh, two weeks following the surgery, no fever, the knee feels warm, the SED rate and CRP are slightly high, and there is a grade one or grade one to grade two effusion. He's getting pain when he's doing physical therapy, otherwise he's comfortable. Will you aspirate, yes or no? Parag. I will definitely aspirate him. I will see if it grows something or not. If it does grow something, then I would uh, go for a debridement. If it doesn't grow something, then I would do antibiotic suppression. Aru, will you aspirate or wait? If the effusion, definitely aspirate. Dinsha? Aspirate. aspirate. Andy? I, I'd see the patient. Sounds daft, but you've got to see your patients. And you'll get a good feeling pretty quickly. If you've got any doubt, I'd uh, aspirate, send that off. And I'd also repeat the bloods daily for a couple of days to make sure it's okay. But... And, and if the fluid came out not quite right, I wouldn't wait for a culture. I'd get in there and wash it out. It'd be very aggressive. Very okay. I just realized I forgot to mention one thing in my talk about knee motion. With the quadriceps plasty, it works extremely well. And I've only had twice ever had to do a VUI plasty. And the rehab following a quad, quads plasty is so easy. You just get on with it. Whereas with a VUI plasty, you've got a significant weakness for that reason. So, you have to be careful, but VOI pass is rarely, rarely needed. Apologies for getting, for getting that. No, no, no. So over to Sachin to conclude. Sachin, there are more questions, but we can go all night. But I think uh, all good things this have come to an end as this uh, lovely session. Uh, over to Sachin Tapasvi to conclude. Yeah. Thank you, Parag. And uh, at the outset, uh, 
thank you andy for uh, sparing time and you know joining us uh, on the net and uh, enlightening all of us with your ex rich experience uh, thank you dinshaw for uh, fantastic deliberations as always good presentations and completely clearing a lot of concepts uh, thank you aru thank you sandeep thank you nilesh and anshu for being uh, firstly organizers of our uh, ne course and also for spending your valuable time uh, chipping in with your comments with your suggestions and your questions uh, thank you ashok for uh, allowing us to use your platform he is the mastermind behind this and uh, just as i was about to start talking he just sent out a text message saying that uh, conservative figure is that we have 4500 attendees for uh, today's webinar uh is he makes a conservative guess because he will know the exact number of people who have watched on youtube only after 24 hours and uh, he uh, says that he has seen maximum number of questions coming in so that speaks uh, very highly of the rich content of this webinar and uh, thank you to all the viewers and all the attendees we are sorry if we couldn't take your questions but uh, certainly i think keep sending in your questions we'll reply to we'll try and reply to each one of you individually on uh, whatsapp or through email and um, i think uh, with this initiative i would like to definitely congratulate uh, all of us if i can say so and we definitely want to meet uh, next saturday same time and we'll have a different guest faculty and a new topic uh, to discuss so thank you all of you and thank you once again Uh, Andy for joining us from the UK. Thank you so much. Thank And you. Ashok, you can uh, end the seminar with your comments now. Ashok, so, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Andy, sir. It was an amazing talk. And to listen to all four speakers, a comprehensive guidance about this particular topic. And I got so many questions that I'm sure even Parag sir's inbox is all full. Yeah. nearly around more than 200 questions all over yeah <laughs> uh, we'll have to have one session just for question and answers looks yeah, like I it think, uh, it's okay. all full is in work so thank you very much again thanks on family and thanks pkc for this opportunity thank you very much and uh, stay <laughs> safe india is on lockdown for another two weeks so stay safe and stay secure bye guys thank you so much thank you bye